Good morning. All right, let's do that again. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Hey, man, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord. You know, even though we went out for a little bit for some family time, I still miss my church family. You know, it's not the same when you're not in church, at least for me. I don't know about you. Well, all right. See, it's even good to be missed. Well, we have a few announcements this morning. First of all, I want to thank everybody who took part in the jump start. The results was awesome. And I really had a good time. And like Mark said, being on the chaplain committee, that wasn't hard for me, man. Because I talked to a weed if it passed by. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it's just who I am, <laughs> you know. And I really knew a lot of the people out there, so it was really great. I, a lot of the people from the community I grew up in, so I knew a lot of them. So we want to thank everybody who had a part in that as well. Okay, we have a baby shower for Janelle and John Garcia on Sunday, September the 5th at 4 p.m. here at the church in the fellowship hall. I said 15th. Did I say September 15th? Well, you missed the one. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, but okay. So, what is this here about the on the flyer that says the twelfth of September? Okay, it's RSVP. Okay, that's something different. Cause that had me confused. Both dates were different, you know. So, so there's also RSVP on September the twelfth at from four to six p.m. at the uh, youth room here at the church. Okay. Now we have a membership transfer. Second reading for Danny and Kimberly and Andres. See, I messed it up anyway. From Ashland Seventh day Adventist Church to the Amberley Seventh day Adventist Church. And then we have, we're going to try to do all these time because they're all second readings. Then we have membership transfer requests for John and Deborah LaFon from the Amberley Seventh day Adventist Church to the Cloverdale Seventh day Adventist Church. Well, no. Oh, girl, see, you, you're messing with me. <laughs> I was like, I thought they was already gone. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and, the, and the third membership transfer request is Sam and Janie Starkey from Mount of Blessing Seventh-day Adventist Church to the Amarillo Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, can I get a second? All right, it has been approved. All in favor? Is everybody in favor? I hear but a few eyes. No, I hear, hear a lot of eyes. Gonna miss the LaFonts. That little short guy for sure, you know. <laughs> he was a good plumber and he was just a good guy all around, you know, so it was awesome. And Callie has an announcement this morning. And one more before she come up. <laughs> uh, one more announcement. There will not be Wednesday okay. night Bible Praise study. whoever did that. Praise you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you know, I didn't want to miss that one out. There will not be Wednesday night Bible study this week, but it will resume the following week. Okay. And then we have a men's breakfast tomorrow. I missed the last one. I heard it was a lot of men. So let's see if we can get more men than on this one. Amen? Amen. All right. Just real quick, I just want to correct for the baby shower. It does say the 15th on the announcements, but on the flyer it says the 12th. It actually is the 15th. Just to clarify that for anybody that was confused by that, and it will be in the youth room. So, okay. This morning there's a couple things I want to talk about. Surprise, right? I have, I always have lots of things to say. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is I heard a quote this week from an Adventist pastor that I thought was really interesting, and I wanted to share it with you guys. What was interesting is he said, Seventh-day Adventists are not an antiquated movement from the 19th century that have nothing relevant to say to a 21st century. 
true? Um, I find that to be very, very true. I'm finding, though, that more and more of us are believing that our message is antiquated, our literature is antiquated, and our health message is antiquated. Are you coming in contact with other Adventists that have this belief? It's actually very, very sad to me because we are not another denomination among thousands of other denominations. We have been called by God to live and give his words to this world. You thought I had just little things to say this morning, right? <laughs> then let's start doing that by actually living it and giving it. Because our uh, message is very relevant. Our literature is very relevant, and our health message is very relevant. All right, my second thing, of course, is I want to talk to you all about the book challenge. My uh, passion. So next week, we will be handing out the book for this fall's book challenge, Adventist Home. How many of you have been reading this book or have read it? Okay, so this is a good time to read Adventist Home. Uh, this challenge will start September 14th, which is next Sabbath, and it will run all the way through to December 9th. We'll be reading one chapter a day. It's very doable. And some of you have asked, why only one chapter? Because we're to digest these books, not to sweep through the book. It's to give you time to talk about it, to really uh, meditate on what you're reading. So, and for those who know me, I am very passionate about these book challenges. You see, we are in a time where we need to stand for the truth in our homes. Do you believe that? Man, I'm, I really believe that. And we are in desperate need of Joshua's. Now, you all are looking at me with confusion, and let me explain. So open your Bibles to Joshua 24:14. If you have your Bible, your phone, open it to Joshua 24:14. And it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." Friends, we are entering a time like in the days of Noah. And I think it says it best in Matthew 24. And everybody's familiar with Matthew 24, right? The signs of the times. Now, Matthew 24, 12 says, Moral decay will be so prevalent that most people won't even know what love is. How many people do you encounter in this world that do not know what love is? The place where people should first experience love is in the home. But if the average American family is only spending 37 minutes per day of quality time, how much of that time is given to God to know what love is? So please, understand that the reason we are doing these book challenges is to prepare hearts for the soon return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I said it last week, but it's worth saying again. What good is it if you know all things and you do not have God's love and leading in your home. So let us as a church consecrate our hearts and our homes to Jesus Christ and be like Joshua that said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So may God richly bless you as we go and start to read this book starting next week. Please be here to receive it. And not only that, let's live it. Amen. Thank you for my time. Good morning. This morning we're going to start with a new um, opening song and then we're changing it to um, This is the Day. So if you will all join us in standing up and helping us start this new song. Um, we kind of learned it last night on the fly, so join us in learning it today.
This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you that we can come together and worship you. I just pray that you will... Send us your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and our minds. And I pray that you will continue to bless us and help us to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now it's time for our children's story, which I enjoy them Just as much as they do. So that means there's still some kid in me. <laughs> you know, so children ask the adults hang up, hold up the dollar bills. We ask you to go around and collect them and please say thank you. <coughs> Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Little ones like me sat upon his knee. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Jesus loves the little ones like you, you, you. Jesus loves the little ones like you, you, you. Little ones like you saves them through and through. Jesus loves the little ones like you, you, you. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Little ones like me sat upon his knee. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. How many of you have ever had a ride on an airplane? Okay, let me ask you another question. Was it an airplane like this? Any takers on this one? I've ridden one. I rode it with a crop duster. How about one like this? Any takers on this? A helicopter? I have. They're lots of fun. Well, our mission story is about a bush pilot. Do you know what a bush pilot is? He's a pilot that flies very remote places where not even trucks, automobiles, bicycles, not even uh, motorcycles, or not even four-wheelers. It's so dense. They, where do they have bush pilots? They have them in South America. They also have them in Alaska. And our story this morning is about one who lived in Peru. This little country right here in South America. And in fact, you see this, um, see this one line? It's real purple. That means it's a jungle, a rainforest. And that's why people can't get, well, one day, Clyde Peters was flying over the, the jungle, and he could see dozens of little huts all over the place. And uh, each village had about three, four, or five huts in it. And it also had, each village also had a witch doctor. Now, one the witch doctor was afraid that he was going to lose influence on his people, so he said, now be careful, don't ever go near any airplanes, and don't ever go down 
to Nevada where they have medical help. Because he says, the pistachios will get you. And they'll put you in a big pot and boil you down to this nothing but oil. And then the foreigners will use this oil to lubricate their shotguns and rifles. So you don't want to go near them. Well, there was a boy about 12 years old. He was a Kampa. That's a different type of Indian. And he helped his father fell trees. You know what that means? To fell trees? To cut them down. Well, one day, a tree fell on him. And it, a branch went into his lung. And it pinned him to the ground. And so his dad raced back to the village. And he got some friends and the boy's mother. And they raced back to the place where he was pinned to the ground. And by working together, they were able to lift the tree off of him. And when they did, his mother said, Oh, because you know it's in the back. And she could see all this blood. It was spurting out. And she said, He's dead, and they didn't see any breathing. Well, when they picked him up and carried him back to the village, he started breathing again. Now the parents were faced with a, they were faced with a real dilemma. Were they to take him and let the, the witch doctor, now they'd seen the witch doctor take tobacco juice and mix it with alcohol and then say prayers to the spirits? Was this going to help his injury? His injuries were so serious. His parents didn't think that would work. The Holy Spirit was working on their hearts. So they picked him up, and they headed towards Nevada. It was going to take them three and a half days to walk through the jungle because it was very thick. Just had a pack. And when they arrived at Nevada, the missionaries looked at him, and they realized it was much too serious for them. So they made an emergency call to Clyde Peters, to where the airplane was. And when he got the call, he ran out to the hangar, fueled the plane, and took off. In about an hour, he arrived at, at Nevada. And when he got out of the plane and and um, saw the boy, he cringed because, you know, the, the, the piece of the, of the limb was in the back and it was all bloody and all, you could see maggots on it and it was, it stunk so bad because it was all, all dirty and everything. It smelled like a dead person. That's how bad it was. And Clyde says, Hey, you want me to f to fly him over to over to the, the the place where the doctor is? And they said yes. It's much too serious for us. So there was an interpreter there by the name of Juan, and he he told Quincy Query. He said, "Now, when you get to feeling better, don't run off in the jungle. Stay because they'll bring you back when you're well." And then Clyde asked Juan if he'd say a prayer before he started the engine. So Juan prayed that they'd have a safe trip. And when Clyde got in the airplane, before he, before he closed the door, he said, little fella, can you smile? He said, we're being nice to you. I'm being nice to you. Can you be... Can you be nice to us? Well, of course, he couldn't understand him. So he taxied out to the end of the runway, revved up his motor, and when he did, Quincy Query grabbed his leg, and he didn't let go until they got back to, the, to where Clyde was from. And Clyde noticed, too, that when, on the way back, not only was he, his hand was, his hands were around his leg, but man, he was also shaking. So when they arrived at the, and, and Clyde was wondering, he said, you know, is it worth all that we're going to do to try to save this boy's life? Do missions really pay? 
Well, when he got to the uh, city where he was from, the little town where he was from, and he landed and cut the engine and let the plane drift, drift in. And he opened the door, and there was his four-year-old Linda. And he thought, my Linda, our Linda. You know what she does? She, she doesn't matter to her how smelly and, and dirty kids are. She just takes them out, plays with them, and everybody has a good time. And so then he loaded Quinty Query up in the Jeep and took to the hospital. And the doctor looked at him. And he said, you say they were on the trail three days? He said, it's a wonder he lived through it. And Clyde said, do everything you can, Doc, to save him. And so he said, well, I don't know. So he pulled the twig out of his back, gave him a first thing he did was he ordered blood transfusion because he had lost a lot of blood. In fact, when, when Clyde picked him up, beside him being smelly and dirty, the inside of his eyelids, which are usually pink, were almost white to show you how much blood he'd lost. So the doctor ordered a blood, blood and he scraped all the migas off of the wound. It really looked kind of bad. Ray scraped it off. And he said, Clyde, he said, uh, he's going to do better if you take him home. And he says, since he's full of worms, we're going to send you the medicine with you to give him. So Clyde took him back, and he t took him to his home, and he said, Eleanor, that was his wife, he said, would you make a bed for him in the hang? She says, Clyde, we can't do that. He doesn't understand English. We don't understand, I mean, he doesn't even understand Spanish. We can't talk to him. He said, She's got, he's got to stay here with us. Now, the P Peters didn't have very many good sheets, but she did. She got a couple of the best and started making a bed for him in the living room. And Peter Clyde said, well, he doesn't even know the difference between a blanket and a sheet. Why are you using the best sheets we have? And she said, Clyde, I'm treating him like a king because that's the way Jesus treats us. So she got the bed all made, and then she brought him a glass of orange juice with ice cubes. And he howled when his tongue and lips hit the ice cubes, because he'd never seen ice cubes before. He didn't know what they were. And she fed him something. And, and Clyde says, well, he says, I know that not only are you, you know, you're, you put our best sheets on his bed, but you're also going to feed him the best food. And she did. And uh, she um, started the stove. Now, he'd never seen a kerosene stove that looked with a wick. It had a wick. And he was fascinated when she started it and watched the flame go all the way around the wick. Well, she put a pan of water on it and started to boil. And then, um, then after she fed him something um, and they were going to have worship, I couldn't help but peek when they prayed because he wanted to see what Quincy Query did. And Quincy Query climbed out of bed and stood at the and kneeled at the end of the th Peter's children, the three Peter's children. And when he, when they folded their hands, he folded his hands. When they shut their eyes, he shut his eyes. The next morning, at breakfast, Eleanor served him, or she served the family, gravy on toast. Oh, he thought that was really good. And then they also gave him some bananas and papayas, things that he was used to at his home. Well, he stayed with the, when he got to feeling better, uh, then he could join the children. He could go outside and play. 
And he stayed with the Peters for 30 days. And one day there was a teacher, and she also spoke campus, so she was able to tell him. She said, now, couldn't you query? Um, Clyde is going to take you, you back to the, to your village or to Navati, and, uh, and and so you know, don't do any, don't do anything. And the smile that was on his face, it just sank. And then before they knew it, he disappeared. They couldn't find him anywhere. And I thought, oh no. He's decided that he wants to stay with us the rest of his life, and I don't think that's going to work out. But they even had all of the people that worked at the at the uh, thing at, at the at everybody looking for him. They couldn't find him. And finally, Clyde looked down at the end of the runway, and he could see him coming. And he had something in his hands. He wondered what on earth it was, and he noticed he was all scratched up, because what he had done, he had gone into the, into the, the uh, Forster room, and he kept motioning to the kids towards the birdcage, and um, uh, I, I, yeah, I forgot to tell you too that when. Um, Linda saw him for the first time. She says, hola, como estas? She didn't realize he didn't speak Spanish. Well, when they opened the birdcage and he let loose a little bird. Now, the, uh, they, they called it, uh, see if I can get this pronunciation straight. Siete colores, because it was a seven-colored tenanger. And Clyde was amazed, because you know how he, Clyde also noticed that he had a slingshot around his, his uh, neck, what he had arrived with. Well, Quincy Quarry had been in the, the forest. He got all scratched up. But with his slingshot, he had made a soft mud ball, and he had knocked it out of the air, and it wasn't even injured. And Clyde thought, man, if I had done that, I'd still be making soft mud balls. Well, then, um, and I forgot to also tell you, too, that when Clyde showed him how to use the bathroom, they had one of those fancy toilets that he had to flush. And then when they cleaned him up, because he had been partially cleaned up at the hospital, but the family had to help him to clean up without using the, uh, without getting the wounded back back. Well, also, um, when it had finally healed and everything, um, then he, and Clyde had also showed him how to comb his hair, wash his wash his face, and he'd given him a mirror and a comb. And after that, he'd go in several times of the day and comb his hair. I mean, it was something he hadn't experienced before. Well, when he, when he left, the, the, the Peters gave him some more clothes, and um, he had his, his uh, comb and, and mirror, and he was just as happy as he could be. And because he'd see people come and go, he just climbed up in the airplane, fastened his seat like he'd done it a hundred times, and they flew back to Navadi. And when they got in close, um, they could see there was a lot of people there. And for the next 20 minutes, it was just a blur. They, they couldn't hold his parents back. They ran immediately to the plane, found out he was all right. And they were just amazed. And then uh, Clyde had to go into the office before he was going to go back. And when he went back to his plane, oh, there was a whole bunch of yucca. And Juan told him, he said, the parents worked it out with the other Campa Indians, and that was to show their appreciation. And Clyde says, well, there's enough here 
that it would fill three airplanes. So he filled as much as he could, put it in his plane, and flew back. Because they wanted it especially, especially for the Peters family, especially um, Linda, because Linda was special to Quincy Quarry. And on the way back, Clyde couldn't help but wonder, are missions really worth it? No, even if, he says, this just taught me to speak treat everybody with love and respect I'd like the least of these just like Jesus treats us and if you want to find out more mission stories about the adventures of Clyde Peters and his family tell your mom and your daddy to call the Texas ABC and order a book called The Man Who Jumped Off of Clouds it's written by Wellesley Muir you can go back to your seats. If you'll please stand with us or sit with us, whichever is more comfortable. Um, we have a couple of old songs for you today. Well, they're old to us, maybe new to you. <laughs> um, if you'll join us today, we'll have our short praise service. <laughs>
nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Church budget, and you know that we have to have. the world to help others.
Now it's time for our congregational prayer. Uh, you saw the uh, prayer requests in your bulletins. If you fill one out, you can bring them forward and put them in my Bible. If Let us all kneel. Thank you, Heavenly Father, once again for being in your house on this beautiful Sabbath day. And Lord, I want to thank you for the Jumpstart program. As successful as it was, we know it was no one that, but you who brought it into play and, and brought it into completion. Lord, continue to use us for many, many projects like that, Lord, that we may reach the community and touch each and every heart in this community. Also, Lord, we have these prayer requests that have come forward. You know what they are. You know what they need and you know what they desire. We ask you, Lord, to fill them according to your wills. Even those that have had them on their hearts, Lord, we also know that you know the heart. Fulfill the desires of their heart. Answer their prayers according to your will and in your time. And Lord, we just want to thank you for this church family because we have come a long ways, Lord, but you continue to work in us and lead us and guide us Lord, continue to show us the way in which you want us to go. We just so thankful for all you do. In Jesus' precious holy name. We also ask you, Lord, to touch our young people. And we need more of them, Lord. Continue to lead them and bring them closer to you. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Oh, 
beautiful day, huh? Hold on. There we go. So, let turn on the green one for the moment. We get them both working really well. You know, in my, in my younger days, I really loved to run. But with that said, now, I wasn't really fast. So I wasn't going to outrun anybody. You know, and I really probably wasn't going to outlast anybody either. But nevertheless, I still love to run. I even ran a half marathon once. I didn't finish last, but I wasn't that far away either. But today, you know, when you, when you think about long distance running, Probably you're going to think of someone from Kenya or even Ethiopia to, well, those type of athletes, because they, they just seem to run faster. And, but, but long before these, these two countries started producing really strong athletes, there was a young man from Tanzania. And his, his name is embedded in history. You see, the year was, well, the year was 1968. And John Stephen um, Akwari, he was in Mexico to, to bid for Tanzania's first gold medal. But he wasn't used to the uh, heights, uh, the high altitude in, uh, in Mexico. So he, he had to adapt his body to it. But the problem is he didn't have time because he just arrived there just in time for the marathon. Well, as he started the race, he, st he started cramping. Is that okay? So he started cramping, and as he... Well, I'm just dropping everything now. So he started cramping, but he said, you know, if he could just get through the pain of the race, well, Eventually, all those cramps would go away. So here he is. He's running all the way into the back of the, uh, of the line at this point. But it's okay because what? 
a lot of marathoners run towards the back of the the back of the track and then they start gradually building up when they get closer to the end of the race but the pain got worse and he just kept hanging back and about halfway through this course well there was a big wreck and all these people piled up and of course our uh, quarry was there too and with all the pain that he had it really didn't take much to hurt him and knock him over anyway well during this thing a couple of people stepped on him as well after he was treated they well after he was treated they found out that he had a a, a bruised shoulder and a dislocated knee and it was it, they were told that well maybe he needs to stop the race but he made a point to say I'm not going to stop I'm going to keep going so with this dislocated knee bruised shoulder and all the cramps and now all the severe pain that he had from the accident He was still in the uh, still in the back of the pack an hour after the uh, Mamo Woldy won the race, but he kept running. And it said that it was like I said everyone at, everyone had already started to pack up all the equipment from the television crews just so that well they didn't figure anyone was coming. So here they are, they're packing up, and all of a sudden they see this uh, young gentleman struggling and limping towards the finish line. So they rush all of their cameras, get them back on, and film this young gentleman limping towards the finish line. Like I say, it was an hour after he, the race had won that this gentleman actually came in all alone in pain and well he was still holding his head up high you know they they asked him why he wasted all this time running when he knew he couldn't win when he was in all of this pain when he had a dislocated knee but he just simply said my country didn't send me 5,000 miles to start a race he said, my country sent me 5,000 miles to finish a race. Beloved, the life we live in is not always easy. And there are going to be those times that, that you cramp up. There are going to be those times that you dislocate a knee. Well, and the truth is, there's always going to be a reason to quit. But, uh, but act like act worry demonstrated to us if we decide not to quit it really doesn't matter what the obstacles that you had in your life and the truth is it really doesn't even matter what place you finish in it's all about finishing the race and I truly believe that it's also well we need to remember that Jesus didn't send us here to this church today to just sit in the pews and start our race. He sent us here so that we could finish the race and be with Him in the kingdom of God. You know, one of the Bible, one of my favorite Bible verses when I think about this has to be 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, or 6, verses 6 through 8. Because he says, I have already been poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. And I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He says, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Beloved, as a pastor and 
well, maybe even more so sometimes, Satan does everything he can to trip us up. But, but Jesus has, has given us all the strength that we need to stay strong even when Satan does everything he can to ensure that we're going to quit. So today I thought I would give you four good reasons why you should never quit. Now my first reason, it may sound a little simplistic, but it's just simply tomorrow is going to be a better day. But, but if we look through Scripture, we find that this idea that the, the weeping will only endure for a night. You know, over in Psalms 30, verse 5, here it says, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So, however many bad things may be happening to you today, we need to take comfort in the thought that tomorrow is going to be a better day. I mean, think about this. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why does God allow, well, allow his followers to go through all of these trials and tribulations? I mean, think about it. The, the truth is that this is probably one of the most difficult parts about the Christian walk. You know, being a disciple doesn't make you immune to life's trials and tribulations. But it, but it still doesn't, I guess that still doesn't answer the, the main question here. Why does God, why, why does a good God and a loving God allow so many things to happen to us in our lives? I mean, it's disease, injury to ourselves and especially our loved ones. And, and not to mention all the hardships and the worry and the fear that, that are involved in our daily lives. I mean, surely if he loved us, he would, he would want us to go through all these things, would he? See, if you listen to a lot of the, the health and wealth uh, preachers out there today, they will tell you that if you're not healthy, if you're not wealthy, then you're not following God's plan for you, and you're not in his favor. But the truth is, the Bible clearly teaches us that God loves those that, who are His children. And we're told what? That He works all things for those who love Him. I mean, Romans 8, verse 28 tells us, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Beloved, you are all called according to his purpose. So that must mean that all the trials and all the tribulations that he allows in our lives are all part of, are, are working together for all, well, for our good. So therefore, the, the, the believer and all the trials that we go through must be there for a purpose. Beloved, as in all things, God's ultimate purpose for us is to grow more and more in the image of His Son. I mean, Romans 8, 29 tells us, For whom He foreknew, as He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. This is the goal of that Christ has for each and every one of us. We are all predestined to be with Him. It's just a matter if we choose to be with Him or not. So this should literally be the goal in every one of our lives. And we should be able to rejoice in those trials and tribulations that we have. We need to understand that, that they are designed to enable us to, to become stronger. They're part of the process of sanctification. So being, a, being set apart for God's purpose 
and, and fitted to, to, to live for his glory. And the way trials accomplish, accomplish this is explained really well, I think, over in 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Because in there it says, In this you greatly rejoice, it says, Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's how I understand the trials that we go through. And that is for, for true believers, their faith will be made sure by the trials that we experience. See, trials develop a godly character that enables us to, well, to do as Romans 5 verse 3 and 5 tells us. It says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation produces what? Perseverance or patience in some. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, however, we, I, I think we must also be careful that not to make excuses for our trials and tribulations either. Because 1 Peter 4.15 tells us, but let none of your suffer, none of you suffer as, as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. See, God will forgive our sins because, what? Christ died upon the cross. He suffered it. And he paid the ultimate price for them. However, we still have to suffer the, the natural consequences for, for the, the choices that we make. But God will even use those to make us stronger. To mold us and shape us for, for his purpose and his ultimate purpose. Well, his, well, for our ultimate good. So the trials and tribulations come as both a purpose and a reward. But the second one is that, that hope is the raw material for faith. Beloved, we are told that faith can move mountains. And hope is that raw material for the faith. That is why the, the devil does everything in his power to make you hopeless. He understands that hope deferred will literally make the heart sick. In Proverbs 13, verse 12, he says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but the desire comes. It is a tree of life. So we, we've got to learn to not allow the devil to kill that, that hope in our lives. See, as, as, you, as you're still alive, there is still hope to be had. The Holy Spirit will never let you go as long as you never let him go. I, I like the way Solomon puts it over in Ecclesiastes 3, uh, 9, verse 4. But for him who is joined to all living, uh, there is hope. It says for the... <laughs> says, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Maybe I could have picked a better choice there. but You get the idea. Just hold on to your faith. No matter what happens. And you will find that, you will find a kind of hope that never disappoints. Okay, how about the third one? No friction, no movement. Beloved, Joe is an engineer. And if you ask him, he's going to tell you that friction causes what? It causes things to wear down, and it, it leads to things wearing out and breaking. 
But he should also tell you that without friction, there is no movement. You know, this is why it's easier to walk in gravel than in mud. And when we're faced with lots of hard times, it literally is heaven's way of telling us that we need to continue on moving forward. Beloved, the most conducive environment for, for movement is when there's friction. See, the, as I was looking through, one of the interesting things I found out about friction is that you can't get anywhere without it. But yet, it, it's, its whole purpose is to slow you down while you're getting there. See, for me, it really comes back to, to knowing that God is in control of our lives. Yes, there may be friction in our lives, but it, if Jesus is with me, nothing can stop me from that forward motion. I like the way Luke 12, verse 6 and 7 puts it. It says, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. See, when we are encountering friction in our lives, remember and, and, and truly believe that God is still in control of it. But that really brings us to our fourth one, too. And as that is, when we read the account of, of the winds and the waves obeying Christ over in Mark 4, verses 35 through 41, well, here's what happens. And we're going to start at verse 37. But it says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the, uh, in the stern sleeping, asleep on a pillow. It says, And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, He says, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are, you, uh, why are you so afraid? He says, how is it that you have no faith? And they, fe uh, they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? See, what, what makes the storms easier to overcome in our lives is not so much the sturdiness of our boat, but the fact that Jesus is there with us. Hey, what the disciples did not understand is that when Jesus was sleeping in their, their boat, there was no way that storm was going to kill them as long as he was in there with them. So the next time we, we start to fear those, those times in our lives, we just need to remember that Christ is in you. And Colossians 1, 27 tells us, it says, to them God will make them known what are the riches of the glory of the uh, mysteries among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I, and I think we can't forget, too, what we find over in Hebrews 13, verse 5. Because he says, let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. So even though a warrior didn't, uh, didn't receive the gold medal that he was hoping to receive, he was remembered because he was a finisher. You will not be remembered for the things that you start in this life. But rather, you're going to be remembered for the things that you finish in this life. Hey, this is the best part about being part of this Christian race, is that you're not rewarded for, for finishing first. Is that you're, you're rewarded for finishing strong. I mean, how much do you believe in your heart? 
I love the old saying, draw, thy, uh, draw nigh to God, and God will draw nigh to you. We need to have a constant connection with Jesus. Beloved, there are going to be those in life who, who live in skepticism. There are going to be those that do not believe there's a God, and if there is a God, if they believe it, then they're going to say, well, he's probably just a cruel God anyway. There are always going to be those people with wavering questions and doubts in their experience. But beloved, we need to open our hearts and accept the light that flows from Jesus. But we need to remember also that we cannot do it alone. For the first two years of living in my house, my wife went outside every morning and pulled those little viney flowers out of the ground, the weeds. She hated those weeds and she'd pick them up only to find next morning there was twice as many of them. But you know, it was only after we called the lawn guy, Fred, and he come to assist us, that all the flowers went away. Beloved, we cannot do this on our own. The Holy Spirit is there to assist us. He will help us stop to growing that doubt in our hearts and get rid of those poisonous plants that are they're hanging out there, keeping us from, from truly trusting Christ. You know, thank God that he gives us victory. We, we just simply need to remember that it's not how we started, but the fact that we finished. The Holy Spirit enables us to, to walk with him, to, to ensure that we will win and that we will finish that race. The only question is, are we going to try to finish the race on our own? Or are we going to walk with Jesus and letting him guide our path? When we stand for our closing song. strong Lord and even bless, bless the food that we're going to take as a part of our part line. the Lord we're truly grateful for you we love you and we pray these things in Jesus name amen, amen. Uh, don't forget we got a potluck and I know there's lots of good food